Okay, so welcome back to the Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. Um, so for our second talk today, it's a great pleasure to have Amadeo Esquelia, um, who's going to talk on factors in randomly perturbed graphs. Thanks a lot, Alex, and thanks also, Christina, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, even in this virtual setting. So today I'm going to talk about a recent joint work with Julia Butcher, Olaf Patsy, and Josef Skogan, all based at LSE as myself. And before going through the results and a little bit of the proof idea, I want to start by giving you some motivation and a bit of background behind the problem. I think we are all familiar with the notion of factors in graphs, but let, let me start by recalling what an H factor is. An H factor in a graph G is a collection of copies of H such that any two copies does, do not have any vertices in common and all the copies together cover the vertices of G. For example, it's quite easy to see that this graph has a triangle factor. I can take the red triangle and the blue triangle the two triangles do not intersect in any way, do not have any vertex in common, and they cover all the graph G. Now, the general question we are interested in in this talk is to give conditions on a graph G which guarantee the existence of an H factor. Now, clearly, a necessary condition is that the order of H divides the order of G. But for the rest of the talk, I will just ignore this trivial divisibility condition. So each time you will hear about H factor, you can always assume that this condition holds. Now, this is a very rich area. There are quite a number of natural conditions one can look at. So I will only mention those that are relevant for the talk. And in particular, I, I will focus on the case where H is a click or H is a cycle. So we are interested in click cycles, uh, click factors and cycle factors. And then I will mention briefly what is known also for general H factors. Okay, so I want to start from the minimum degree condition in graphs. So the idea is that we want to determine what is the minimum degree threshold, which guarantee that a graph contains an H factor. Now it's a very well-known result of Karadi and Hanel that the threshold for a triangle factor is 2n over 3. And how should I write this result? Well, th this result is telling me that any graph with minimum degree at least 2n over 3 contains a triangle factor. And the condition cannot be improved. I cannot take a lower, a smaller minimum degree. For example, I can consider this complete tripartite graph with parts of size n over 3 n over three minus one and n over three plus one. Now this graph has minimum degree two n over three minus one. So just one smaller than two n over three and does not contain a triangle factor just for balancing reasons. And that's why I call two n over three the threshold for the property, the minimum degree threshold for the property of having a triangle factor. The result was then generalized to larger clicks by Handel and Samaridi. And actually we also know the threshold for a cycle factor. This was conjectured by El Zahar and then solved by Abbasi. And the threshold is N over two if L is even and something slightly more, slightly bigger when L is odd. We also know something for general age factors and indeed Kuhn and Donius Kuhn and Ossius determined up to an additive constant, the minimum degree threshold for H factors for any H, for any graph H. And the interesting thing about the result is that somehow the parameter that controls the minimum degree threshold for an H factor is the critical chromatic number. That is either just the standard chromatic number or something slightly more complicated. And so somehow it's not surprising that the behavior of the cycle factor depends on the parity of L. Okay, so this is one condition that we can look. A different condition is, a, is conditions in the context of random graphs. 
And here we consider the, the binomial Erdős-Fendi random graph. So we have n vertices, and each edge appears with probability p independently from all other choices. And in this context, we would like to define a notion of threshold for the appearance of a H factor. Now we say that T is a threshold where T depends on N and depends on the graph H. If the following is true, when we work with an edge density that is omega of T, then we always find an H factor in GMP. And when we work with a density that is little of T, then we don't find an H factor. And as we are working in a random setting, all the statements I will make are asymptotically almost surely statement, meaning that they hold with probability tending to one when the number of vertices tends to plus infinity. Okay, so we, for, for threshold random graphs, we actually know the answer when we look for uh, click factors or cycle factors. And this has been proved by Johnson, Kahn, and Bull. But actually their work is much, much more general than that. They conjecture the value, the threshold for any, for H factors for any graph H. They gave the proof for a class of graph H and then this proof was extended to other, graph, to other graphs. So somehow, but somehow the problem is still open in the sense that there are graphs for which we have a conjecture for the threshold of H factors, but we still are missing a proof. Okay, so, so far we have considered conditions in, mini, in, in graphs, conditions in random graph, and now somehow we would like to interpolate between these two models and looking at conditions in the so-called randomly perturbed graph. But before giving a precise definition, let me add a little bit more intuition. So when we work with a random graph, we can also morally think to the random graph as the outcome of the following random process. We, we, we start with an empty graph on n vertices, and then we start throwing in some edges in a random manner. Now, what happens if instead of starting from the empty graph, I start with a graph that already has some density. And then again, as before, I throw in some edges in a random manner. How does the resulting graph look like? And again, under which conditions can I guarantee uh, an H factor? Now we study, we formalize and study this question using the model of randomly perturbed graph introduced by Bowman, Fries, and Martin. And the definition goes as follows. We have two parameters alpha and p between zero and one. We denote by G alpha any n vertex graph with minimum degree alpha n. And then we take the union of G alpha and the random graph GMP. So you can really imagine that the situation is the following one. We have some dense graph G alpha, and then on top we add the random graph GMP. So some, and, and then we look at the union of both graphs. So some edges will come from the dense graph G alpha and we will call these edges deterministic. And some edges will come from the random graph and we will call these edges random edges. So again, we want to define a notion of threshold for this graph model. But this time the threshold, well, still depends on N, still depends on H, but this time it also depends on alpha because we have this additional parameter for the minimum degree in the dense graph G alpha. And we say that T is a threshold when, if we work with an edge density with a P that is omega of T, then whatever the graph G alpha is, so with whatever graph with minimum degree alpha N I start, then I always find an H factor in the perturbed graph. And when I look for when I work with a P that is little of T, then there exists at least one choice for G alpha for which in the perturbed graph, I don't find an H factor. Now this threshold problem as can be seen from quite a number of different angles. One can say, okay, I would like to consider the case of small alpha. And what do I mean by small? Well, if alpha is equal to zero, then the graph G alpha 
as minimum degree zero. So it's just the empty graph. And so the, the model corresponds to the poorly random model. But now if alpha became strictly positive, I have some few deterministic edges. So somehow I can think that the dense graph is helping the random graph GMP to get this spending structure. So somehow I have a threshold at alpha equal to zero, that is the threshold in random graphs. But now maybe if I have a few deterministic edges, if I can rely on, the, on these edges, maybe my threshold decreases a bit. Maybe the random graph gets the spanning structure here, here. And then on the very opposite side of some of the, the picture, we have the case of small p. And what do we mean by small p? Well, usually uh, constant over n, because in this case, in expectation, we are adding only linearly many random edges. And so somehow in this case, I can think the random, that the random graph is helping the dense graph to get the spanning structure in the following sense. I know that at some point when alpha is big enough, I already find an edge factor in G alpha alone, and I don't need to add any random edges. Now, maybe I'm slightly below the minimum degree threshold, but I am allowed to add a few random edges, maybe only linearly many of them. And maybe in this case, having these random edges will allow the dense graph to get the spanning structure as well, even if I'm working slightly below the minimum degree threshold. Right, so these are two possible directions and these were the first directions that people investigated, but somehow we are interested in all the range in between. So we not only want to understand what happens when alpha is small or when alpha is close to the minimum degree threshold, we want to understand also what happens in between. So somehow we would like to understand the evolutionary behavior of the threshold. As I said, in this intermediate regime, nothing much is known. One exception is given by click factors. So now let me focus on uh, click factors. Um, right, so for, for click factors, we have the case of small alpha. This was determined by Balog, Treglund, and Wagner. And apart from the numerical value of the threshold, the interesting thing is that this threshold coincides with the threshold for an almost KR factor in the dense graph alone. And what do I mean by almost KR factor? I mean that for every positive epsilon, I can find a um, KR tiling covering all but a few vertices, all but epsilon n vertices of GMP. So intuitively, the result is telling something very interesting. With this edge probability, I already find an almost KR factor in the, in the random graph. And now having a few more deterministic edges allows me to turn this almost KR factor in a perfect click factor. And that's actually what always happens. The result of Balog, Tregolan, and Wagner is, is more general. They basically solved the case of small alpha for any age factor, and they proved exactly this. So the threshold for small alpha is the threshold of an almost factor in the, in the random graph. And then there was a, a, a more recent result by Han Morris and Tregolan that looked at this intermediate regime and determine the threshold for all alpha um, in the intervals of the form k over r and k plus one over r. And the interesting part of this result is that the threshold is not a continuous function. The threshold is constant within each such interval and then jumps at the end point. So let me visualize a little bit better what happens for triangle factor. For triangle factor, we said, well, when alpha is bigger than two over three, a triangle factor already appears in the dense graph and we don't need to add any random edges. So the threshold is just zero. 
On the opposite side of the table, when alpha is equal to zero, we are in the poorly random model and the threshold is the threshold for Johnson's canon rule. And then we have the case of a small alpha from Balog, Tregolon, and Wagner. And as you can see, at alpha equal to zero, the threshold jumps down and it loses a logarithmic factor. Now that's something that somehow, so we are saying that starting from a dense graph rather than from the empty graph saves a logarithmic factor for the threshold. And that's something that happens quite often. So also for other age factors, but surprisingly not always. There are some graphs age for which the threshold at alpha equal to zero and the threshold at alpha positive and small coincide. So somehow for these graphs, having a few deterministic edges does not really influence the threshold for the random graph. Now, coming back to the, to the triangle case, uh, we have also the result from Anne Morris and Preglon when alpha is between one over three and two over three. And therefore we have another jumps, another jump when alpha is equal to one over three. We know quite a lot, but actually we still miss the behavior of the threshold when alpha is precisely one over three. So we still don't know what happens when the threshold jumps down. And in general, the same boundary cases are open for large reflex. So we know everything except this, uh, these boundary cases. And that was the state of art when we started working on this problem. Right, so we started from uh, the triangle case at alpha equal to one over three. This is the only uh, open case. And we claim that when alpha is equal to one over three, well, you, you can see that when alpha is bigger than, alpha, than one over three, the threshold is one over n. We claim that at alpha equal to one over three, this is not enough, and we need to add an extra logarithmic factor. And why is that? Well, consider this complete bipartite graph with one part of size n over three and the other part of size two n over three. Now this graph has minimum degree n over three. So this is our candidate for as a graph G one third as our the dense graph we want to work with. Now I want to add a random graph and I want to be able to find a triangle factor in the perturbed graph. Now, given the sizes of A and B, given that B is the double of A, if I want to do that, better if I put my triangles with one vertex in A and two vertices in B. And so I will have two edges coming from the dense graph G alpha and one random edge. Now, why this is better? Well, because if I don't do that, then at some point, I will have to find a triangle entirely contained in B. And so a triangle on entirely contained in, in the random graph. And this is actually harder. Now, if I put my triangles, if I put all my triangles in this way, what do I see? Well, in B, in the larger part, I will see a perfect matching in B in the random graph GMP. And therefore, the threshold, the perturbed threshold at alpha equal to one over three should be at least equal to the threshold for a perfect matching in the random graph. And this threshold is very well known is log n over n. So this argument can be formalized, but this is the main idea. We need to see a perfect matching in the random graph. And so we need the threshold to be at least log n over n. What we were able to prove is that log n over n gives the right threshold. So there exists some constant C such that when P is bigger than C log n over N, then I always find a triangle factor in the perturbed graph. Okay, so unfortunately our theorem does not extend to larger clicks. And I will mention at the end what are the main challenges and the main difficulties, but we can say a few more things than just triangle factor at alpha equal to one over three. So let me go in, into that. So first of all, we can say we, we can distinguish between an extremal and the non-extremal case. 
where by extremal I mean that the dense graph G alpha looks like this complete bipartite graph. I will say in a moment what I mean precisely by that. So we can prove that when the graph G alpha is not close to this extremal graph, then we can already find the triangle factor when we work with probability constant over n. So somehow we have a stability version of our theorem. We said before, at alpha equal to one over three, we do need the logarithmic factor because we have this, this example, but this is the only reason for which this logarithmic factor is needed. As soon as I know that I'm far away, uh, then I don't need to add the extra logarithmic factor and already constant over n is enough. Moreover, we can handle also smaller minimum degree. So not only we can do something with alpha equal to one over three, but also with alpha not, uh, not too small. And in this case, we get alpha n many disjoint triangles. Right, so somehow we have a perturbed version of the Dirac theorem. We, we have a smaller minimum degree and also we get, smaller, we get a smaller number of triangles. And moreover, when we know that the graph uh, G alpha is non-extremal, then we can work with a smaller minimum degree. So we don't need alpha n, but alpha minus gamma n is enough. So in particular, when alpha is equal to one over three, we get a triangle factor in the stability case, uh, already assuming minimum degree is slightly below n over three. And this result is, of course, is best possible uh, for, the, for the edge density P. Why? Well, if alpha is smaller than one over three, then I can just take G alpha to be bipartite and now if I want to have alpha and many triangles, since the graph G alpha is bipartite, I need at least one random edge for each triangle. So I need to see at least alpha and many edges in GMP. And if I want linearly many random edges, I need P to be at least constant over N. Right. So that's our stability theorem. And in general, the general version of our, of our theorem is the following one. So in general, we do need to add the extra logarithmic factor and we can always guarantee delta G many disjoint triangles. And here somehow I want to stress that we, we don't have any assumption on the minimum degree delta G. We don't require it to be linear. It can be also very small. This really applies to all graph G. One more thing about our results. So our result extends to cycle factors. So for cycle factors, we have a similar picture. We know uh, that when alpha is bigger than some alpha star, we don't need to add any random edge. We know the case of the poorly random model when alpha is equal to zero. And we know the case of small alpha. We extended this result to cycle factor and we filled the gap for the threshold in the case of cycle factor. At alpha equal to one over L, the threshold is log n over n. And when alpha is bigger than that, the threshold is one over n. And the theorem extends exactly in the same way. So also for cycles, we have a stability version and we can end it also a smaller minimum degree. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about our results. So I think it's also a good time for questions before I go to some proof idea. Okay, great. So let me sketch a little bit uh, the proof idea that we use. Uh, as I said, we have an extremal case and a non-extremal case. So let me start from the extremal case. Um, and for simplicity, I will always assume alpha to be equal to one over three. So I really just want to talk about triangle factor and not this more complicated case of less of a, le of a smaller number of triangles. So in the extremal case, I have a graph G with minimum degree n over three. And now as I assume that G is beta close to the extremal graph, where the extremal graph is this complete bipartite graph. 
And now, what do I mean by beta clause? Well, I mean the following. I mean that I can split, I can partition the vertices of G into two sets, A and B, where the size of A is roughly n over three. Maybe not n over three, but n over three plus or minus beta n. And the size of B is two n over three plus or minus beta n. And moreover, between A and B, I can assume some minimum degree condition. In the extremal graph, it will be n over three. Here, I assume something still linear, say n over 10. And moreover, apart a few vertices in A and a few vertices in B, all the other vertices see almost everything to the other side. So somehow, apart a few vertices, all the others have almost full degree to the other side. And finally, in B, I only see few edges. Okay, so this is what I mean by uh, a graph being beta close to the extremal graph. Now, what do I do with this graph? Well, first of all, I want to cover with triangles, uh, the vertices that has that have small, small degree to the other side. And then I want to cover a few more vertices in such a way that I'm left with two sets, A prime and B prime, where B prime is precisely the double of A prime. Now, since I already covered all the vertices with small degree to the other side, between A and a prime and B prime, I have a very large minimum degree. Here, actually, I have an almost full degree because I already took care of the vertices with small degree. And now what do I do? Well, remember that I'm working with some probability bigger than constant log n over n. So I can find a perfect matching in B prime. And then, what I need to do is somehow to match vertices of A prime to matching edges of B prime, where by matching this vertex to this matching edge, I mean that this vertex sees both uh, endpoints of the matching edge. And so overall, this will give me a triangle with two edges from the dense graph and one edge from the random graph. And so now if I do, if I mean, now all is left to show is that I can really find a perfect matching and therefore I can cover A prime and B prime with a triangle factor. And this is somehow easy because I have an almost full degree between A, a prime and B prime. So I can just check all condition. So somehow in the extremal case, the difficult part is the cleaning procedure at the beginning. After, I, after this cleaning procedure, then the, the matching part is, is kind of easy. Okay, so that's how the extremal proof goes. And now let me switch to the non-extremal case. So here we have a graph, again, with minimum degree n over three, but I said that in the, in the stability version, we can assume even a smaller minimum degree, so I can work with minimum degree one over three minus gamma n. And this time I assume that G is not beta close to the extremal graph. Okay, so what we do, we apply the regularity lemma. And then we use this stability tool from a paper of Balog, Musset, and Skoken. This stability tool tells that in the reduced graph, we can find a matching with these many edges. Now, in general, when I apply the regularity lemma and I look at the reduced graph, the reduced graph inherits some minimum degree condition from the graph G. So I can always say that the reduced graph has minimum degree, say one over three minus four gamma BR. So in general, I can only guarantee this many, I can only guarantee a matching with this many edges. But what the stability tool is saying is that if in addition I know that the graph G is not close to the extremal graph, 
then I can do better. Then I can guarantee more edges. I can even guarantee more than VR over three uh, edges in my matching. So the situation is the following one. I have large matching. Let's say I take one maximal matching and then I have some leftover. And the leftover is an independent set, right? Because I could, otherwise I could extend my matching. Now I look at the vertices in the independent set. This vertices still has some minimum degree. So I still have it some minimum degree condition in the reduced graph and the edges cannot go inside the independent set. So they need to go to, to the matching. And so just greedily, I am able to cover the vertices in the independent set with an additional matching where for each matching edge, the other endpoint is in one of the old matching. So overall, the stability tool is saying that I can cover my reduced graph with some copies of cherries, K12, and some copies of matching edges, K11. And so when I go back to the original graph G, I will have some regular cherries and some regular matching edges. But somehow the matching edges can be easily turned into two copies of a regular cherry. So if I lie a little bit and I, forgot, I forget about the exceptional vertices, the stability tool is telling me that I can cover the graph G with regular cherries. And now I would like to add a random graph and I would like to cover each cherry with a triangle factor. But that's actually is not possible. Why is not possible? Well, imagine that between the two regular pairs, I not only have the edges from the regularity, but I really see all edges. Now, this graph is just the graph that I showed you at the beginning. It's bipartite, it's complete, one part of size n over three, the other one two n over three. And I already convinced you that to cover this graph in the perturbed model, I need P to be at least C log n over n. On the other end, I claim that I can handle the uh, stability case, the non-extremal case already when P is constant over n. So I need to do, so this idea does not work. I need to do something a little bit more clever and we use the following embedding lemma. So we work again with regular cherry, or I mean, this time they are super regular, but that's not hard to guarantee. We still have that the leaf cluster U and W have the same size, but this time they are slightly smaller than the center. And now I claim that in this case, I can cover the cherry with a triangle factor already when the probability P is constant over N. And why is that true? Well, somehow I will find a few triangles with one vertex in U, two vertices in B, and the same one vertex in W and two vertices in B. And then the majority of, of the other triangles in the way you would expect, one vertex from each cluster, two deterministic edges and one random edge. Now in this case, I don't see anymore the problem of a perfect matching because between U and B, U, U and W, well, it is true I find many random edges, but this is only a large matching. It's not a perfect matching and the large matching already appears when P is constant over N. So somehow I don't run anymore into the problem of the perfect matching. Okay, so that's somehow the, the, the main idea behind the non-extremal proof. I am well aware that I'm hiding under the, carp under the carpet many details in the sense that uh, we need to do quite some work before coming to the application of this lemma. We need to deal with exceptional vertices, but especially we need to unbalance our regular cherries so that we can apply this lemma. So we need to make, we need to cover some vertices so that the leaf cluster are smaller, 
while keeping them of the same size and while keeping the total number of vertices in HRA divisible by three. But I hope that at least I gave you the idea of where the improvement on the edge density comes from in the, uh, the non-extremal case. The, the trick is really working with unbalanced cherries rather than just the standard ones. Okay, so this also hands the, the proof for the non-extremal case. And now in the last few minutes, let me say a few words about larger cliques. So the first open case is where alpha is equal to one over four, and we want a K4 factor. What should be the threshold in this case? Well, we can consider the following graph. Again, it's bipartite, one part test size n over four, the other one three n over four. And now we want to add a random edge and we want to find the K4 factor. So again, given the sizes of A and B, if I want to do that better, if I put one uh, vertex in A and three vertices in B, and therefore I will see three deterministic edges and three random edges forming a triangle. And again, I want to do that for all copies of K4. So overall in B, in the random graph, I will see a triangle factor. So similar as before, the threshold, the perturbed threshold at alpha equal to one over four should be at least equal to the threshold for a triangle factor in the random graph. And this is known, so we, we have a conjecture value for, for the perturbed threshold. Everything is nice, except that this is actually false. And actually the, the counterexample is not so hard. So we start again from this complete graph. We unbalance it a little bit. So we move n vertices from the smaller part to the bigger part to make the big part even larger. And then to compensate for the minimum degree, we add a few, we add copies of KMM in the larger part. So here we again have minimum degree n over four. And now assume that I can cover the perturbed graph with a K4 factor. Since A is small, A has only n over four minus m vertices, I should find at least m k4 entirely contained in b just because of the sizes of a and b and now i can just check with a first moment calculation if this is possible and actually for a small epsilon and for m not too small and not too big the expected number of k4 in the graph b is strictly smaller than m and so in particular i will not succeed in finding a k4 factor and now there is nothing really complicated behind this calculation. I, I can really list all ways a K4 can appear in, in the perturbed graph and then find the expected number of each such copy. And even more interestingly, the same calculation shows that even if I try to work with say, n to the power of minus two over three plus some epsilon, then even this probability does not suffice. And so somehow we, we don't really know what should be the threshold, the right threshold when alpha is equal to one over four. On the other end, we know that when the graph is non-extremal, again, when the graph is not close to this extremal example, then the threshold for alpha bigger than one over four works as well at alpha equal to one over four. But in general, we don't know. And somehow there is nothing special about K4 factor. We can extend this counterexample to larger clicks and show that we actually have the same phenomenon. So I really would like to advise this uh, open problem about the other boundary cases. Um, try to, to, to say a few more things about what, what happens for, for other boundary cases and for larger clicks. And finally, I already mentioned that uh, this perturbed threshold is very well studied when, when alpha is small, but in general, much less is known. So for the intermediate regime, we know everything about the clicks except the boundary cases. 
After our work, we know everything about cycles, but in general, much, much less is known. So again, this is an interesting problem. It might be quite hard in the sense that already understanding where the threshold should jump is not clear and maybe is heavily dependent on the structure of the graph age. So maybe giving a general result might be quite hard, but still I, um, I find this problem interesting and I would love to see more work on that. And with that, I finish and I thank you for your attention. So Amadeo, thank you very much for a uh, fascinating talk, some lovely, lovely results and questions. Um, so uh, if anyone would like to ask questions, please do either ask in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Maybe I could start off by, um, so if you can, can you go back to the, um, to the picture for triangles? Yes. A second. Yeah, so, so you've got this, um, you, you know what happens at alpha equals a third. Um, so it's sort of natural to ask what happens if you kind of zoom in and look kind of close to n over three and if you're sort of just below n over three or just above n over three, do you, do you know what happens? So in other words, not epsilon n up, but you know, n over three plus log, on, log n or n over three minus uh, right. log n, for example. So. Is, is there a very sharp change or does it, is there something smoother? Right, that's something we don't know, but it's, uh, yeah, it is interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Right, somehow we know that at alpha equal to one over three, this is the only complicated example. In the sense that if we, mm -hmm. um, if we are far away from this, then uh, already one over n works. So we, we get the same threshold uh, for alpha bigger than one over three. Um, yeah, apart from that, I think we cannot say much more. Okay, thank you. The, the, the other, other question I had was, so if you're looking at one of these threshold results, do you need every vertex to have degree alpha n or is it sort of robust in the sense that you could have some scattering of vertices of lower degree? So it's, it's I, um, I couldn't quite see from the proof what, what, what you were no, using. Right. No, 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 so, right. so we, no. So our, our methods like heavily, depend, heavily depends on the fact that every vertex has this large minimum degree. So I think that at least using our idea, we, we cannot somehow, um, uh, we, we cannot have vertices with a smaller minimum degree. We really need that every vertex has this, uh, this minimum degree. Okay, okay, thanks. Does yes, anyone else have questions? <laughs> I guess I have a sort of vague question. So um, what about other conditions on the starting graph than minimum degree? Because, I mean, it's quite well studied and a, a good place to start. But when you're looking at, uh, for example, this, um, the triangle factor, somehow the, uh, the thing is a few vertices that aren't in triangles. So you, you might think it might be or might not be a sensible question to say, suppose your starting graph has every vertex in a triangle, and probably that's silly for some reason, but there, there might be quite different conditions that are interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I mean, big. yeah, this model has, has been considered in quite a number of different yeah. ways. You can, mm -hmm. uh, you can have like different condition on the graph, but you can also say, well, I don't want to add maybe the random graph, but slightly something slightly similar or slightly different. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think there are quite a number of uh, different conditions that one can look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the minimum degree is just one of them. Okay, any, any, any other questions? Okay, in that case, I'll... I'll stop the recording. Um...